Hey guys, Tune Nine Marine here, bringing you another Marine Corps stories. Um, this week, as I seem to have done quite a bit recently, I'm going to be posting this earlier uh, than normal. Uh, this week, I'm heading to Vegas Friday morning, so I won't be here to be able to post it like I normally would. Um, uh, we're going to go down there, me and the wife, and going to hang out with a bunch of my Marine Corps buddies. Maybe a drink and do things that <laughs> I know I normally would do, especially with your kids. Um, so that'll be fun. I'll try to take some pictures, maybe some video, so I can uh, maybe make a little montage or something so that you guys can see our shenanigans. No promises, but uh, you know, see what I can do as long as I'm not too hammered the whole time. Um, yes, yeah, so this week I wanted to talk about a couple different things, um, a few things in mind, but I think I'll put that off uh, for the time being, you know, for maybe next week or the week after. Um, I want to talk about Iraq. Um, I had Somebody asked me if I could kind of talk about, you know, the day-to-day, -day, what to expect there. Um, and obviously, Iraq's over. Um, hopefully, we don't go back. Uh, Afghanistan's pretty much wearing down. So, I think this would be good to kind of give you a, a basic idea of what just a combat deployment in general um, is like. Um, keep in mind, when I was there, you know, it wasn't World War III. Um, there were no major invasions, um, you know, city assaults, things like that. So, I mean, obviously during that kind of time, I mean, hell, I don't know, North Korea invades or something crazy, or we go there, whatever, things would be a bit more, uh, a bit crazier. But, regardless, I think this will give you a good, good idea of what it's like for the guys there. Um, <coughs> So anyway, to start it off, we what will happen is you'll obviously you'll know you're going to deploy, but you'll do all sorts of pre-deployment training, um, whatever they feel you need to know, and from there, from there you you do all that, blah blah blah, and then you'll know when you're leaving. They generally won't tell you the exact date until you're pretty much ready to go because. Let's just say Marines are idiots. I'm sure this extends to other branches, but idiots and on Facebook, oh my god, I'm going to Iraq, you know, July 1st or something. They give the exact date. Hell, they, I've even heard of them giving like the airport they kind of fly out of. They know they fly flying out of. And so, you know, the government doesn't want troop movements like that advertised on frickin' Facebook and, you know, whatever other social sites you can go to. So, I mean, that stuff's usually kept pretty hush hush. Um, so, I mean, but, but you'll know, and you'll be able to tell your family. Um, so, you know, so they can come down and say goodbye, especially if they live you know, far away. Um, but, yeah, so you'll get up, you know, super early the morning you're leaving. You'll, almost all your stuff in the barracks should be cleaned out, should be packed up, put away. They have, like, a, a company or something that comes on and helps package all your shit and inventory it and then you, know, you sign for it saying yeah this is my shit it's labeled with my name blah 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 and I'll get away back um, <clears throat> so you get out to do that you'll clean up the rooms one final time um, and then you will head to the armory you'll pick up your weapons um, you'll go any extra gear I mean, we had sent out a few weeks earlier when we sent out our howitzers that we were bringing with us. They took a ship there, because you can't really fly with a bunch of, with a bunch of howitzers I'm in an airplane or something, but... Yes, yeah, so they took a ship, so they were ahead, and we had sent people with them, but any gear that you're bringing that you can bring on the boat with you, you'll go, you'll get ready, and you'll bring it down to the buses, wherever that is. Um, and so then, yeah, you'll get down there, and depending on the size, I mean, Oh yeah. Depending on 
how big will depend on how many people are there, obviously, uh, how many people are deploying. Um, but essentially, you'll be down there, all your gear, your sea bags, your day packs, all that shit will be. Um, your ilbies, which is like your big, big, big pack that you, you have. Um, all that stuff will be packed. They'll be all lined up, nice, neat rows. Um, they're going to pull up big semi trucks to load all that shit up. You know, if a working party of Marines who um, get tasked out to load that stuff in the truck or trucks and. Once that's done, the buses should show up. Oh, Christ, I'm tired. And, and then you will uh, get in formation, and your families will be there. Your CO, whether it's your battery CO, company CO, you know, your battalion, whatever, they give a little speech, say blah, 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 gonna go kill the bad guys. And then they'll generally get one final goodbye <laughs> with your family. Um, I got that recorded too. And then they start loading everyone up on the bus. You'll have your rifle, pistols, saw whatever you got with you. Um, cruiser of weapons like the 240 and the um, 50 count stuff will be on a separate vehicle, so you don't have to worry about that. But your personal weapons will be on you. And you get on the bus and you'll shuttle your ass to wherever the airport is you're leaving from. And from there, it's sit around and wait, basically. You're going to sit there at the airport forever. You're going to shuffle around. You don't wonder what the hell's taking so long. Even though know, you can see the bird outside, you're going to be fucking waiting there forever. And then, <clears throat> eventually, the you know, you'll get the word to get on the plane. You guys will get in line. You'll have little... I mean, it depends on how they do it, but they'll definitely give you, like, little passes to show you're supposed to be on the plane type of thing. And you'll get on the bird, you'll sit down, and they'll take off. And depending on where you're flying out from, where you're going, You'll probably have a layover somewhere. Um, and then you'll do your layover, you usually get off the plane, you know, for an hour or two to stretch, and then so they can refuel the bird, whatever. And then um, from there, you'll fly the rest of the way. And it depends where you're flying into, it depends on the situation. Um, but you'll. <laughs> No, it'll determine how you land, basically. If it's a hostile airport, you're going to be flying in, doing a combat landed, which essentially is a plane dropping like a rock from the sky to avoid rockets, uh, missiles, things like that, and it scares the shit out of you. Let me tell you, when they do that, they don't, they don't warn you to do it. It's all of a sudden it feels like you're crashing, and uh, you'll probably piss yourself. It's, it's funny how many guys freaked out, but yeah, so you'll, you'll, you know, eventually you'll land. And then from there, it's a matter of figuring out, you know, like I said, like, before the war started, and people were stationing or prepping in Kuwait. They get to Kuwait, you know, they get on their gear, they would sent their tanks over, you know, their howitzers, their trucks, whatever. And they'll get up, meet up with all that stuff, they get all that stuff ready to go. Um, and then, and then they waited for a long time before they finally got word to, to cross the border. Um, for us, we land in Al Assad, Iraq. We we landed in Kuwait first, we there for a little bit, and we flew in Al Assad a couple days later. But I mean, it's, it's all dependent, obviously. But you'll get there, and we had to get up with our howitzers. Our howitzers were all smashed down on the boats, so we were fixing those. Um, and then we basically waited for our orders, and we uh, got into a huge, huge convoy, and. I think it was like 80 to 100 vehicles, something general, a big supply convoy. And, and you go. Um, man, our trip it shouldn't have taken as long as it did. I don't know what the hell our vehicle commander, or not vehicle commander, but convoy commander was doing. And she's a lieutenant. And man, she was smoking hot. I remember she was this skinny little blonde. She could have been a model, uh, you know, before joining the Marine Corps. It was ridiculous. But, Yes, everyone was staring. I don't think anyone paid attention to the uh, actual mission brief. We, uh, yeah, needless used to say, <laughs> she's distracting. But, yeah, so the, the trip from Al Saad to where we were just uh, um, north of Haditha. Well, we were technically just south of Haditha, but on the other side of the Euphrates. And trying to remember the map here, and 
the trip really should only have taken like two hours, two and a half hours. Because we only stopped, we only stopped once. Like, and that was in Haditha, and then we broke off from there. But this trip took like, oh god, it was like ten hours? Something retarded. And we, we were just driving and driving and driving. And it felt like we were going around in circles. Uh, but you know, we were alert, we were doing what we could to stay focused, because. I mean, it's our first, you know, first convoy there. Didn't know what to expect. Uh, and some people were on. You know, freaking, we're alert, to say the least. Um, but we'd been up for like the past two days, getting ready. Um, you know, some people were tired. It was kind of like that when you're super tired and you start doing, you know, tons of energy drinks with those little energy pill things. What they call them, like, no-dose or something. And, and you just get that super hyper energetic alertness, I guess, even though you're exhausted. Um, we had the same thing, pretty much. And we we got to where we were going, uh, which was in Barwana, and we basically unhooked, got our gun set up immediately, they picked out Hooch's for us, um, and then we got separated into our squads, because for whatever reason they didn't do it before, we got separated, we uh, kind of got tasked to what exactly we were going to be doing. Oh, yeah. I don't know why I'm so freaking, freaking tired. But, so from then, it was essentially we got into like a day-to-day -day routine. We shot the howitzers when they were needed. Uh, at that point, it was mainly for illumination, for infantry that were doing do some stuff for our guys who needed some light um, on the various patrols around the area. Um, and then we'd go out on patrols. We did a ton of foot patrols uh, in and around Barwana. And we did a ton of convoys from there to the dam <coughs> and back. Um, and then south of the ways. Uh, and so, I mean, we did that constantly. We would go on field ops, what we called them, but. You know, basic missions. We had one where we went up to support an infantry um, attack on a town. Um, I don't even know, I can't remember the name of the town, but they were attacking it. We basically provided support for them with the howitzers. Um, and so we did that. We were up, and we did another one. We were out, I don't remember how long, it felt like a month. A long time, just living in the holes we dug in the ground. You know, because they were really concerned about mortars. Our trucks were up armored, but, you know, if you're on the ground, then the mortars start coming in. You're not going to have time to climb up in the back of the same time. Like, one person might be able to, but you're not going to get your whole gun crew up there. So we did have these big old holes that we slept in. Um, you could even call them the grave. And whenever mortars would come in, you know, they said, that, you know, hey, we're going to take the mortar fire or whatever, you hop in the hole and hope for the best, and uh, one thing I want to make very clear too is that, you know, people are like, oh man, it's in Iraq, you know, it's going to be hot as balls, and for us that wasn't the case. We got there in the beginning of October, and we were there through like, it was like May of the next year, something like that, and it was cold as hell. It was freezing below zero, or below freezing at night, and it was just terrible. Um, but yeah, so then we eventually, it, so if, you know, people say it's, if it's cold in Iraq or, you know, oh man, it's not cold there, you stupid, blah, blah, blah. Same with Af same goes to Afghanistan, you can tell them to suck it because it gets freezing cold in both places. I imagine Afghanistan's worse because they got the high mountains uh, that you're going to be working in there. But, <clears throat> yeah, so anyway, we would do that, we eventually moved, um, we moved up to a place called Rawa for a little bit. Did some stuff there with the guys. And then we moved, our whole battery this time, moved to Arupa, which is uh, to the west of everything. And um, <laughs> it's down towards like the Syrian border. So we were down there doing stuff. And I mean, that was interesting. That's really the first time that there was any sort of major contact with the enemy. Um, definitely a lot of mortars, small arms, you know, and 
half-assed trying to attack our dudes. Um, you know, people on patrol. Uh, IDs are a huge concern. But, I mean, nothing serious. We luckily didn't get anybody hurt or killed. Um, you know, which you can't do much better than that. Um, but, yeah, so we're down there, and, and, and Rupert was probably the roughest time. One, because, you know, you're, you're consistently worried about the enemy, but two, for whatever reason, we just didn't have a lot of anything. Uh, I remember going a couple days without food. Um, only had like one or two water bottles for the whole day, for those three or four days. And by this time, you know, it was getting towards May, um, late April, and it started to warm up a bit. And so, yeah, people were starting to hurt. Um, Heat wise, and then not having food and stuff it just didn't help anything. But, you know, it is what it is. You're going to go without food, you're going to go without sleep. I mean, we were constantly tired. Um, we were usually up for about 20 hours a day, depending on, on what we're doing, sometimes more. Yeah, and it's, I mean, you get into a routine. It depends on what your job is, obviously. If you're infantry, you're going to be doing patrols constantly. You're going to go out, come back, go out, come back. Same thing, over and over. Um, depending on the what's happening, you'll have different you know, uh, missions. You might have a big assault, like you know, when they assaulted Fusion 04, when they took uh, Marja in Iraq here a couple years, or Afghanistan here a couple years ago. Um, so you'll participate in that sort of thing. Um, and so it's, it just depends. I mean, if you're... I wouldn't say lucky. Some people might consider lucky, but if you get stuck on a big base like Camp Leatherneck, um, Al Saad, uh, things like that, you're going to be bored out of your fucking mind. I couldn't stand the thought of being there for long. Um, and so I'm happy I got to leave the wire. Like, we were constantly asking to leave, to go do our own thing, to go on patrol, yeah. stuff like that. Um, sorry, wife texted me. And, you know, so we had no desire to be stuck on, on the base. So, I mean... If that's what happens to you, it's what happens. You know, there's no point fighting it. If you can get out, good your patrols, do it. But you know, don't feel bad if it's just not your your uh, time, I guess, to go do those sort of things. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's how it is. And one thing I want to talk about real quick is sandstorms. I'll, I'll try to find some pictures of sandstorms and make it up, you know, put it like in a rack video or something that kind of shows our time there, but you get these sandstorms that are just insane. I remember being on post one time, and it was getting towards the evening, it was probably four or five days from me, and talking to a guy up in post, came up to chat for a little bit, and all of a sudden we just, just looked to the, that would have been the west, I believe. All of a sudden there's this huge black wall, and we're like, what the hell is that? We thought it was like a big storm over there, and we realized that it's rushing towards us, and he could get down. He got out of the post. He's like, man, fuck this. But I was on post, so I couldn't get out. So I had to hold down the Mark 19 and the uh, and my rifle and everything else out up there. And all this huge wall of sand just hit the whole town. It was just crazy. Kuwait, the orange is sand. Which the sand is orange. Um, so when that stuff hits, you can't see a damn thing. You can barely see your hand and hold it out in front of you. It's just craziness. I'll try and find those pictures I have of this different sandstorms. Let's just say they're just as crazy as you might have heard. Uh, they'll knock your ass down if you're not ready for it. Um, yeah, it's good times. Um, but yeah, so I think I'm going to uh, cut it here, guys. Um, like always, if you have any particular questions, something I didn't cover that you wanted to hear about, let me know. I'll make sure to write it down and try to talk about it next week. This one isn't as long as I'd like, so I got some things I gotta take care of. Um, but I can always do, you know, I like part two type of thing if you guys have specific questions. Um, as always, follow me on Facebook and Twitter. I'll have the link in the description for both of those. And then just make sure you keep requesting, keep liking, uh, all the stuff. I certainly appreciate it. Um, I love doing this stuff, so I'll, I'll keep putting stuff out. Alright guys, simplify.